This is Real Estate Rookie Show number 21. My name is Ashley Kerr, and I am here with my co-host, Felipe Mejia, and he has really exciting news to share. What did you do for the first time ever? No, it wasn't a Tesla, but it will be soon. But no, it wasn't the Tesla. <laughs> this time, no joke, I went camping for the first time ever. So I always wanted to do that when I was younger. Everyone in my school, like friends and family and all that always did it. But I just we just never did as a family. We were worried about other things. And I finally bought a camper and took my family camping. It was great. It was awesome. Please share with them uh, what you took camping with you. So I know you think it's funny, but I took our flat screen. And I hooked it up to the to the wall of the of the of the camper, and I actually had left it there. We're just gonna get another one, but yeah, I was super excited. On to other things, Ashley. You look like you've actually been working. You're tan. What what is going? Are you outside? Did your husband put you outside? No, I've been uh, landscaping. Yeah, doing my uh, rehab. We did all the landscaping. We're waiting for the electrician to finish inside. So we figure we might as well start with the curb appeal uh, while we're waiting for him to finish, and then we can move on to drywall. But I have to add something to your camping because it's like funny to to listen to you talk about the flat screen and stuff. Because when I grew up, camping was we got into a canoe, packed for a week, and we canoed to our campsite and, you know, stayed in tents and stuff like that. But um, eventually, you know, we did uh, start glamping with a camper and everything like that. But I guess so that's what it's called. Time. We had AC. We had all that. Yeah. <laughs> So when you uh, come visit sometime, I'll I'll take you guys out real camping in a, a tent and sleeping bag, stuff like that. That's hilarious. Well, today's show <laughs> is actually just me and Ashley, and we're going to be answering some of the top real estate rookie questions that we got on the Facebook group. We're going to talk about some of the questions that come up the most, and we want to answer them based on our experience, you know, Ashley and I. And if you guys aren't part of the Facebook group, uh, just search real estate rookie on Facebook and you'll be able to find us and join and make sure this is Felipe's pet peeve. Make sure you answer all of the questions when you ask to join. People, I'm serious. We have like 20 requests of people that don't, you know, follow all the questions and hit yes to that. They're going to advise by the rules. And then we just have to say no because they're not going to adhere by the rules. So anyways, yeah, make sure that you go through all the questions and type in yes, that you're going to adhere to the rules. Let's get started with our uh, first question. Let's jump right in. So we kind of picked questions that are very common that we get asked a lot and a lot of investors get asked by rookies. So the first one is, how do I fund my first deal? Hi, my name is Tanner and I am located in Western New York. I am wondering what is the best way to get started funding your first deal? Good credit and looking to either burr or flip. Thank you. So Felipe, go ahead. Why don't you start us off? What is What do you think is the best way to get started? And how do you find that money for your deal? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think if you're having trouble with finding the finances for the deal, honestly, my first initial gut response is maybe you haven't done enough research. Because if you have a great deal, then, you know, anybody and anyone that has the finances is going to fund it because we're all looking uh, for ways to get better returns on our investment. Um, one of the things that I would tell you is, you know, go out and, 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 and analyze 30 deals, 40 deals, go out and talk to 20, 30 banks, go out and just maximize every single position that you think that you should be in and get those hundred no's out of the way. Because if it really is a great deal, anybody's going to fund it. It sounds like you have a really good credit score above 700 and you're looking to burr or flip the property. It sounds like it should be a no brainer if you truly have a good deal. Now, if you're out there looking for money and someone looks at this and says, yeah, I'm not going to fund it. Maybe it's not as great deal as you think. And maybe you just need to run back to the numbers, Tanner. You know, that, that, that'd be one of the first things that I look. If I look at a piece of property that I'm going to invest in and the numbers make sense, the money has never fallen short. Ashley, what's what's been your um, you know, your kind of history with this? Well, my recommendation would be to find small local banks, you know, banks with maybe seven or less branches or small credit unions and go to them and ask what they can offer you. So I once had a bank tell me that they would get, I asked them just like, I want to buy this house. Here is my bigger pockets calculator report. Here are pictures. Here what I think I can here's what I think I can do with it. Here's what I'd get in rent. They offered me a 90-day unsecured loan for the full purchase price. 
And then after closing, I just had to go and refinance long term with them. And I paid off that 90 day loan with them. And then I had my 20 year fixed financing. So I think that is like a great place to start is just talking to banks since that's what they're in the business to do is lending. I think I, I've told this to quite a few people that I've helped through real estate and it's that, you know, some banks are better for credit cards and then some banks are better for car loans and then some banks are better for single family homes and then some are better for investment properties. It's your job to go find what bank is their niche, right? They're not going to have a big old sign on their front door that says we do real estate, we do uh, credit cards. But if you can just maybe Google that, you will get some answers. For example, I know that Wells Fargo has far more mortgages on their books than any other bank in the country, right? So go start with small banks and work your way up. Figure out what each bank likes to do. Like I said, some small banks love car loans. Some small banks like credit cards and some like real estate. It's your job to go find the money wherever it's at because no one's going to hold a sign outside. I'm thinking as I'm saying that, you know, those guys that are like flipping the signs out on the street. I think that's really cool, yeah. but there's not going to be a bank that does that. You have to go out and make those calls. So Tanner, if you told me this question, what is the best way to get started funding your first deal? I would come back to you with a question and say, well, how many, you know, how many banks have you called? How many hard money lenders have you called? How many no's have you gotten? Or are you looking for your first yes on your first call? My first deal ever was actually with a partner who put up the money for the whole purchase price. And I didn't have to put any money into the deal. And the way I approached it was I just started talking to him about real estate investing. I didn't say, hey, do you want to part partner with me? Or, hey, I need money. Are you interested? I just started talking to him about real estate investing. So if there are a couple of people you have in mind that you think might be interested in investing with you, just plant the seed, put a little bug in their ear about real estate investing, or maybe they're already doing it and just talk to them about it. And then once you have a, a property in mind, bring it to them and and that, then kind of approach it as an opportunity for them. Not that they, you need them, not, don't beg them to invest with you, but show them how you are going to make this a great investment for them. Have pictures, have the bigger pockets calculator, calculator report, have the numbers all spelled out for them. You know, my first real like real estate deal where I had to find funding, the bank gave me something like what they said with you, where you had 90, but I had a five year adjustable rate mortgage. So I had five years to figure it out. And when I first got that, everyone was telling me, no, Felipe, in five years, that might adjust into a, you know, $10,000 a month mortgage. Like, you never know. They can do whatever they want, uh, which also isn't true. But what I quickly realized after the first year was, whoa, I just cash flowed for a full year. Not just that. I have a whole nother four years to figure out what I'm going to do with this property to get out of this bad interest rate. But even with a bad interest rate, I'm still cash flowing, right? Most people want to hit a home run with their first deal, but they don't realize, look, it's okay to just get to first or second or third base. Like you don't have to hit a hundred thousand dollar win the very first time. So, you know, Tanner, uh, to 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 kind of to kind of uh, get off of your question, but to answer it, what is the best way to get started in funding your first deal uh, for a flip, a burr, whatever the case may be? Man, call a bunch of local banks, call a bunch of hard money lenders, run your numbers, learn the verbiage, ARV, ROI, you know, learn all of that. It's great on bigger pockets to be able to do all that. Um, and then, you know, present those documents to that bank, to that hard money lender. And I guarantee you, you'll be able to find the money if the numbers make sense. Yeah, Tanner, here is your action item for this week. I want you to put together that, you know, that portfolio, that folder, that binder of all of that information, even include your your personal financial information and show that you have that great credit score that you have, you know, you you can manage your own money too. put that together this week. And then after that, every day, I want you to reach out to three different lenders, whether that's a bank, it's someone you know that you think would lend to you, or that's a hard money lender. And just start there and do that every day, C complete that task. And I think you'll find that you might even end up with more people interested or more options available to you. 
Yeah, I couldn't I couldn't agree more with that. And then you can always jump on Bigger Pockets, the rookie Facebook group that we have. Post it there. You know, some people will give you some positive feedback on there as well. And you can always run your numbers on the calculator on Bigger Pockets. Yeah, let's move on to the next question, Ashley. Here, I'll read it off to us. How do I find a deal? So this one comes from Chris. It says, How have y'all been finding your deals? I'm closing on a hundred thousand dollar HELOC and looking to buy my first rental. That's really funny. He says that because Chris and Tanner could partner together. Because he's got the money (laughs) and Chris Tanner has the deal. So look, there you go. There's the money. I'm closing on a $100,000 HELOC and looking to buy my first rental. However, be that the HELOC is financing the down payment, I need a property where I can do a burr so that I can get some or all of my money back out of it. I don't really want to be stuck making that HELOC payment forever. Now, I have a few realtors in different areas looking and it seems pretty difficult to find stuff on the MLS that makes sense. What are you all doing to have success? I hesitate to get into direct mail because it is a little overwhelming to me. That's a really good question. What do you think, Ashley? That is, and I find like a lot of people get stuck right there too. So it's it's not uncommon. My first advice would be is to tell everyone and anyone that you want to purchase a property. You know, tell that I'm looking for a duplex. I'm looking for a single family home. Tell people what you're looking for probably about 50% of my deals I've gotten from word of mouth because people know that I buy properties. So that is like the number one thing I would start there. I, I saw this on Instagram probably like a year ago. And then I did it myself was I saw someone on the back of their business cards wrote, I buy multifamily and they left them everywhere. They, you know, handed them out to people. Um, so do anything you can like that to just show that you are buying property and there will be people that approach you. Now that's not, you shouldn't just rely on that waiting for the deal flow to come in. But I almost every single morning I'm looking on realtor Zillow. I go on Facebook marketplace. I go on Craigslist. I go on land watch. I go on all these different websites, HubZoo, auction.com. You're giving away all the secrets, Ashley. You're giving it all (laughs) away. The secret sauce. No, I'm just kidding. And I I just look at them every single morning and see if there's anything on there that I'm interested in. And it takes some time going through all these. And, you know, eventually I figured I'd bookmark all these. So I just click on each one every morning and I have my, you know, search area saved into them. But um, those are two of my biggest recommendations and any off like off market deals I, I have found to be better. So like Facebook Marketplace or Craigslist looking in those those kinds of sites too. Yeah, I agree. And you know, Chris is asking, you know, about direct mail because, you know, it's a, he says that it's a little overwhelming to him and I understand that. But I tell you what, if he goes back and listens to show 19 and show 13 with Ryan Dossie and Drew Wired where they mm-hmm. talk about, you know, direct mail and how important that is, you know, I, I think that he's going to get a little more comfortable, right? I remember Drew was saying that you know, he's got a full-time job and he's doing this and he's doing that. And he's still doing what Ryan Dossie's teaching him to do by direct mail and finding those properties. So I don't think that direct mail marketing is anything that, that you should get scared about. You know, if anything, you know, find Ryan Dossie on, on Instagram and go back and listen to our show, show 19 and show 13, and you'll be a lot more comfortable with that. Now, the other thing that I would tell him is he says that he's looking, you know, how are we finding our deals? It's kind of like Ashley said, because we're out there looking daily. You know, Chris, I would challenge you to look at what you did last week. How many hours did you spend looking for that deal? One, two, maybe three? Versus how many hours did you spend, I don't know, Netflix or uh, listening to the radio or, you know, I don't know, doing other things. Because I'm literally on the phone from where I get from one job site to the next, or if I'm on the way home, I'm networking, trying to find more deals, right? So I kind of tell you this story, Chris. My son is two and a half, and he takes up a lot of my time, like a lot, right? My son is super, super hyper. You know, I'm being a little vulnerable here. Uh, Anybody can go Google this, but my son basically has what's called SPD, um, sensory processing disorder. Basically, he is very hyper all the time, and he doesn't do well with loud noises. He doesn't do well with a lot of crowds. It's a very, very light form of autism, but in that, you know, my son always wants to be with me. He always wants to hang out with me. He's he's like very attached to me because that's what he does. He attaches. So I had to learn to be a very, very fast, what I call it, entrepreneur, meaning on the way home from job sites or, or, or I didn't have any more time to waste. Like that 30 minute ride home where you relax, I don't have that. I'm calling two or three realtors to see what they have on the table. I'm bothering Ashley to see if we can invest together where she's at, right? So 
You know, Chris, I would just challenge you if you're really, really looking for that deal, how many people did you tell this week that you're looking for a deal? How, many, how much time did you spend searching for that deal? And I guarantee you, if you're running your numbers, if you're looking for rentals or if you're looking for a burr, you know, Bigger Pockets is a great place where you can find this information as well. Go to the forums. There's always tons of things about this, like where even the question that we answered before you, where somebody's got deal but doesn't have money. Maybe you have money. So maybe go partner with somebody. That would be a great idea. You know, I always tell people half of a deal, half of a great deal is better than no deal right? Me and Ashley both do a lot of partnerships. We find a lot of great value in that. Yeah. One of the things I can kind of add on to that is driving for dollars too. I mean, that takes work, but that's why you have kids and you train them to look at the meters, how many meters are at the house when you're searching for a duplex. But I and I see in your your picture here that you have a significant other. Ask them, say, hey, if you're driving around, if you see any houses with tall, long grass or papers in the windows, I mean, that might be a bank owned property or a vacant property that someone's looking to dump. A bank owned property, they'll put notices like in the window or like this has been winterized, do not trespass, stuff like that. So those are things that I look for or the tall grass and just like properties that are vacant or for sale by owner signs. You would not believe how many for sale by owner signs I see by the road, but you cannot find them anywhere listed online. So that is like great value. Just tell people you know to keep their eyes open. Tell your parents, tell your siblings, tell your friends. Say, hey, this is what I'm, if you see, you know, any of these things, a for sale by owner sign, you know, a, a property that looks like it's vacant. Hey, just if you get a chance, send me the address or let me know about it. I, th I think you can find a lot of value in that. And then you had mentioned just uh, the MLS, how the deals don't make sense. Low ball offers. Okay. You got to get used to them because you have to do them. And I, I still struggle with it. Like I still feel bad. I don't want to insult people. And, but you know what? It's worked. I've had people say, yes, there was a property that I wanted two years ago that was listed for 90,000. I was patient. I waited. They came back to me and said, we'll sell it for 60. I ended up getting it for $20,000. Okay. That amount of savings was worth, you know, hurting their feelings a little if I insulted them and me feeling bad, but they accepted the offer. It is worth taking that chance. So don't say the MLS doesn't make sense until you're submitting those low, low ball offers that make sense to you because it will happen. There will be someone that just wants to get rid of their property and will accept that offer. Yeah, absolutely. My wife is a realtor here in Nashville, Tennessee, and we actually put in an offer for one of the guys that I'm helping with real estate. And he put in a $20,000 under market value offer and got it in wow, Nashville. Awesome. We're hot yeah. market. <laughs> and the, he put in 20,000. We've put in four offers. They've all gotten rejected. He put in $20,000 under, and we didn't ask why they accepted it, but they did. We're going through inspection. As long as yeah. everything goes well, we're going to close and it's going to be a great deal for him. Another when this is the last secret, and then I'll let you read the next question. But Chris, I would challenge you. And this is one that I've got a great deal. on. actually one of my top producing properties was from a yard sale. I'm not kidding. We pulled up to the, we pulled up to the yard or I'm sorry. My mom was at the yard sale talking to the person that was selling the items outside. And she goes, hey, you know, my son sells house or buys houses. Are you selling by any chance? He goes, yeah, that's exactly why we're doing the yard sale because we're selling the house. We're, you know, have you listed it yet? Nope. So my mom called me immediately. And before he went to market, I offered him, you know, like 5,000 under market value and he took it. A lot of the great deals, you can find good deals on the MLS with those low ball offers. But I think it's even more exciting when it's an unexpected deal, like you're not even going after it and someone brings it to so you. So exciting. But that goes yeah. back to, you know, letting everyone know that that's what you do. Because yeah. like, if my mom didn't know that I bought houses, that'd be pretty weird. Right. But if, you know, anybody, they have to know that you- She would have taken that deal for herself. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's funny? I partnered with my mom on that deal. Oh, you did? Me good, and my, good. Yeah, me and my yeah. mom are partners on that deal. Yeah. yeah I write her like an awesome. $800 check every month. Okay. Let's move on to the next question. And it's, do I need to get my real estate license? So Karn actually asked this in the Real Estate Rookie Facebook group. And he said, should I get a real estate license before I jump to the rental property business? And I am excited for this question because I don't know if we will have like the same answer because your wife just got licensed. So I'm really excited to kind of maybe we'll have a little debate here on this. <laughs> 
What do you think? You know, this is a good question. Do I need to get my real estate license? Should I get my license before I jump into rental property investment? So if we just directly answered the question, it really goes back to how you feel comfortable. I would say you don't have to have it to get in started in real estate. I have my whole portfolio and my wife now got her license. So we went through the process of buying nine rental properties before my wife got her license. Now that we have it, I see it as an asset, but it's still work. So like no one's gonna, no one just, just gonna trust you to sell their home or buy their home. The only extra thing that I have now because my wife has a license is we have access to the MLS. But aside from that, it doesn't really add a ton of value to my real estate investing because it's still a cost that we have to pay monthly for her to have her license. So she has to always be either selling, buying, or just, you know, having a referral. And you know, what's funny is my wife has now made more money with referrals than actually selling or buying houses. So we just refer agents that we know around the country to, you know, if someone's like in Michigan, they're like, hey, Felipe, do you know a good real estate agent in Michigan? And my wife gets, a you know, a referral on that because we do know real estate agents around the country. So if you need a real estate, uh, you know, agent around the country, <laughs> my wife can give you a great referral. But I honestly, don't think we're I don't allowed think... to make those kind of plugs on here. But also, I'm a licensed insurance agent and I get do referrals. Too. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we're so going to get in trouble. No, but it's, no, but I mean, to answer his question, and if we're just being honest here, I don't think you need a license to be a great investor. I think it's just an maybe an extra tool in your tool belt, right? I've tried to get my real estate license maybe two or three times. I paid for the course and started it online. So that was my biggest thing was like, I did it online. That was my first mistake. So I'd have to actually make myself sit down and watch it and learn. And I never completed it. So then like you have a year, however long to, to do it in New York state. And so the time lapse and I'd buy it again for the $99 and try to take the course again. And then as the years went on and I started buying more properties, I was like, why would I ever want to do what my realtor is doing for me? I'm a buy and hold. So Karn's Pacific question was rental property business. So I'm assuming here that he will want to hold for the long term, that these are buy and hold properties. So I don't really sell anything. I am buying and I am not paying that commission. So why wouldn't I want a realtor to do all the paperwork for me, schedule the inspection with multifamily, with duplexes, triplexes, coordinating these showings and inspections with tenants. I would never want to have to deal with that. And I find great value in um, having a realtor do all of that for me because I just don't like that. And I have been somewhat successful without being a licensed realtor. Yeah, no, I mean, obviously your success is is is, is amazing, Ashley. And I think the reason that we ended up getting our license was because we had so many people reaching out and saying, hey, Felipe, we want to buy property in Nashville. And I would just point them in the right direction to another realtor. And by the end of it, we were like, well, I, my wife can just get her license and we can kind of, you know, help people, you know, buy in Nashville if they want to. But I mean, mm -hmm. honestly... I don't think that you have to have a license to start your rental property business. I think if you have the availability to and you have a significant other or yourself that wants to do it and save, a, you know, three or four percent, then go for it. But I think it's like you said, I think there's a uh, bigger, you, you know, bigger fish to fry and, and, you know, you need to be doing something else. That's just another hat that you're going to want to wear. But like you said, if you're buying for the long term, like he said, with rental property, buying for the long term, then you're not paying anything because you're the one buying, not the one selling. Right. And yes, like maybe you could get, you know, you'd get money back in your pocket if you were, you know, representing yourself and you get money off the purchase price, stuff like that for your commission. But uh, for me, it's I, I think of it as just something that's very easy to outsource. And that's something I've been working on with my mentor is what are things I can get rid of? And in February, I got rid of property management and that just, oh, that feels great. And I'm waiting for you to feel that same feeling, Felipe. <laughs> Eventually I will, I need to find, so I I'm know. actually working on it. I'm working on it. I actually have good, good. Uh, two family, a team of uh, two family members that have been helping me the past two months do it. And you're right, it's a great relief yeah, and I'm planning good, on passing good. it on. We still haven't figured out the payment part of it yet because I don't know, like, I've never had a property, so I don't know what it's worth. I've asked them to tell yeah. me what they want to make, and but that's just a conversation for another time. Yeah. Well, to kind of wrap up the real estate license, I would say 
that that is a great way to get into real estate if you're going to be a realtor as your full-time job. If you are going to, you know, do it part-time and add this extra work onto you and it's going to affect you actually finding deals because you're you're too busy learning how to be a realtor or helping other people in real estate and that's it's not your main focus. You definitely don't need to be a licensed realtor to be successful in your rental property business. In New York State, for example, we have to have attorneys uh, to close on a property. So an attorney in New York State will do the contract, will do everything for you basically that a realtor does. Yeah, my answer would be no. I agree. I agree. You yeah. don't have to or, or it's not it's unless it's going to be your full time. It's not a necessity. Well, let's yeah. go to the next question. And this one's a super hot topic. Everyone's on the one or other side of the fence on this one on bigger pockets. Definitely go to the forums, Google it and you will see it everywhere. Dun, dun, dun. And I feel bad because this is a it depends answer. And I hate it hearing is, that is. answer for someone, but that's what we're going to have to say today. Yeah. So this one is from Allison. And it says, good morning. Has anyone purchased a property through their investment LLC company? I have purchased a property in my own name, but I want the next property to be purchased through my LLC. Thanks. Awesome. Awesome. Okay, Allison, I'm going to do my best here. And I'm going to start by saying we are not attorneys. We are not lawyers. <laughs> Let's not get sued. This is just <laughs> things that we've seen or things that I've seen in my city in Nashville. And Ashley will talk about what she's doing up in... Uh, uh, Ashley, New York. Ashley, what what city? What city? <laughs> Buffalo. Buffalo. Okay, in Buffalo. Sorry, but it's, is it is it? Are you in Buffalo or you're not in Buffalo? No, right? I'm like I'm probably like 50 like, minutes from the city. Yeah, was, yeah, but you say Buffalo, so people can kind of get an idea but of where people it's. People would at. never ever know what the name of my town is. Yeah. <laughs> it's like you own your town, right? Because you live on like 200,000 acres or something <laughs> insane. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. Um. Okay, so Allison had a great question regarding LLCs. So one of the things that I would tell Allison is to find out first, because let me give you a perfect example. I have properties in my name, right? And I do want to transfer them to the LLC, but my bank will call my loan if I just directly transfer a property into the LLC. If the LLC is not showing cash flow or some type of history. So what I'm doing, Allison, is running all my cash flow from my rental properties through my LLCs to show history in that LLC. So she's saying that she wants to buy her next property through her LLC. Well, Allison, first I would go find out from the bank if they are okay with that. Some banks will, some banks don't. My bank wants to see two years of my LLC having cash flow for my rentals running through it before I can start making purchases out of the LLC. Now, if I quick deeded the property into the LLC without having prior history, the bank has the option to call my loan and that's scary. So at the end of the day, Allison, is go talk to your bank, go talk to whoever's gonna fund the deal and make sure that that's okay. Now, the only way I've seen it go around this is if you do hard money with the LLC, but it's the same thing. You gotta talk to the hard money lender and find out if they will lend to the LLC. Ashley, what experience do you have? So I think there are two things you need to consider. The first one is bank financing. What kind of financing are you looking for? Are you looking for fixed 30 year? Are you looking for five year fixed amortized over 15 years? What do you want out of your bank uh, financing? Are you going residential, commercial side? Because that will affect whether you should go into an LLC or not. The second thing to consider is liability. An LLC will definitely give you some kind of liability protection, but you could also get umbrella insurance. So let's start with the bank financing. A lot, but not all, banks will only loan to you on the residential side and you can get that low interest rate, 30 year fixed, if the property is in your personal name. So that's why I have done that several times is put a property in my personal name and gotten that 30 year fix because that's the only way the bank would do it for me. So I don't have that LLC for protection and instead I got an umbrella policy on top of that and that provides a protection for me on that property. If you don't care if you get a 30 year fix and you would do five year amortized over 15, I actually just did a, a commercial side that's 10 year fixed um, amortized over 15 years. So there's different options on the commercial side, but uh, that would be if you have the property in an LLC, you can get that that commercial lending. 
Uh, usually the terms aren't as great as doing it on the residential side. So that would be um, something to consider whether you want to put it in an LLC or not. There's one bank by me that will actually lend to you on the residential side if it's in an LLC, but the interest rate is awful. I did it two years ago and the interest rate was 7.35% for 20 year fixed. Um, and then it was residential side with an LLC. And then with the liability, an LLC will provide you pre- protection on whatever assets you have in that LLC to keep you from getting sued personally. But you can also get an umbrella policy that would cover you for that property in case you were sued. So those are the two things I consider looking at when um, I'm going to put a property in my own name or an LLC. Now that um, I'm kind of grown, I've been kind of kicked out of the residential side and I don't even get invited to submit an application (laughs) on the residential side. But I know there's also some controversy as to, okay, should you go and get bank financing and put it in your personal name? And then once you have your loan, switch it to an LLC, which Felipe, you touched on your bank will not allow that. And I see that a lot in um, the Bigger Pockets forums, whether you should risk doing that or not. I have no opinion on that at all because I've never done it and I've never even asked any of the banks that I work with. Yeah, I asked my bank that because I was like, you know what? I'm not going to look at all these forums and, you know, people have different banks and not every single bank is different. So you have to talk to your bank. So what I did to answer that question was I went to my bank and said, hey, if I want to transfer a property into an LLC, will you call the loan? Her response, my banker, she's great. She said, it all depends on your history. Have you been paying, you know, your mortgage for the last two years on time? Yeah. Okay. well, then we're probably not going to call your loan because we're here for the interest. We're not here for anything else. She said, but we're going to look back for two years. Why not just create the LLC, run the cash flow through the LLC for two years, and then you don't have any risk. And I was like, well, that makes perfect sense. So that gave me my answer, right? I can do it after two years. So Allison, I would tell you, go talk to your bank that you're going to want to use and tell them your plan. Don't try to hide anything. Just lay it out on the table. And if you get a green light, go for it. If you don't get a green light, go to the next bank and the next bank. Not all banks are created equally. And I wanted to add something that you had said too about how the bank wanted you to have two years of income and expenses and cash flow showing in your LLC before they would lend to that LLC. I want people to know that that's not always the case, but I think it's it was for you because you don't have W-2 income. You are a full-time real estate investor. But if you Correct. do have W-2 income, you should not have a problem um, you know, creating an LLC, purchasing that property and putting the mortgage um, on that property right away, even though it's a, a brand new LLC. Every situation is different. Every yeah. situation is different, which is why I say don't, I mean, definitely take people's advice, read all the forums on Bigger Pockets, but just go down to the bank and ask. The worst that you're going to get is the answer that you're looking for, a yes, a no, and a how to do it. You can also consult your attorney about the LLC. And I feel bad that we don't have a definite answer for you, but it really depends on what you're looking for liability and what you're looking for bank financing. And if you are going to be worried about being sued and that is like a huge concern and you're going to lose sleep over it, give up that 30 year mortgage and find a property where the numbers work with that commercial five year fixed 15 year term and get that LLC so you can sleep better at night. Because to me, that is like a huge thing is I'm not worried about being sued because I have all of these things put in place to take care of that. If that happens, I'm going to go rent from you, Ashley, and I'm going to, I'm going to test it. I'm going to stub my toe <laughs> yeah. on your property yeah, and see you. what happens. <laughs> All right, let's uh, move on to the next oh, question. You just threw that stub the toe in there. I have to mention this now because Felipe, his one camping story he told me was that he stubbed his toe. <laughs> I did. I have like a, 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 it's all purple. And anyways, we're not talking about my toe. Let's get to the next question. Turnkey. This is also a hot topic on bigger pockets because people, you know, are like, well, don't do turnkey. Well, do turnkey. So let's answer Eric's question. My question is, I live in New Jersey, which is an expensive area for the most part. I know that rising markets are out in the Midwest and some other parts far from New Jersey. What advice would you have about turnkey investing or out of state investing as a beginner? And is it a good idea to invest far from where you live to start out? Thank you. Great question, Eric. Fantastic. Because Everyone has this same question when starting out. Yes or no to turnkey? Should I invest out of state or in-state investing? I would answer this question like this. What's your goal? 
Are you buy and hold? Are you flipping? What is the reason for that you're investing in real estate? I'm going to assume safely that you want to buy and hold a property for the long run. I would call 20, 30, as many turnkey companies that you have the availability to in where you want to invest, where the numbers make sense, and just interview them. See if it's something that works for you. Not just that, get referrals. Ask them for a referral. Who, who have you sold to that I'd love to talk to? Call the people in the city. Find out someone that's bought a property from this turnkey and find out if you know they've got a good rapport. Another thing is, do they have a website? This is Eric, this is a way that you can avoid a ton of turnkey pop-ups up there. You know, Go to Google them before you call them and see if they have a nice website. How long has the website been up? Do they have history? Are they on Google reviews? Do they have a long list of reviews, right? You have a turnkey property that's got five reviews and one that's got 400? Well, there's one that you can toss out the window and just follow that formula all the way down until you get about 10 and then start calling them, interviewing them. Hey, what would you do during an eviction? What's your process look like? Can you send me your standard operating procedures for this, that, and the other? You know, really drill them because at the end of the day, you're marrying this company for a year, two, or three years and a turnkey property, you know, can make or break your first year investing if they sell you a dumpy property or a good property. Ask if they have, you know, property managers on their team as well. What are their turnover rates look like? Ask everything, Eric, and then that's going to really hone in on is it a good or is it a bad uh, turnkey property for yourself, right? Ashley, what do you think? I honestly really don't know that much about turnkey properties. I just know that they're a good investment if you don't have a lot of time to invest in analyzing a deal, finding a deal yourself, and putting rehab into that deal. Your profit is not going to be, or your return on investment is not going to be as great as if you went and you know did all of that work yourself. But sometimes that is your only option to look for these turnkey places and, you know, prove me wrong. Maybe, you know, there probably are some out there that you can get a great deal on and, and get those, um, you know, great returns on them. I really don't know that much and I've never interviewed an actual turnkey company myself, but I, I definitely agree with Felipe is take the time to interview as many as you can. And we are actually really excited because in the near future, we're actually going to be doing a whole episode on turnkey. So I'm really excited to learn about that. But we have a clip actually, since Felipe and I have never done turnkey ourselves, we actually reached out to Whitney Hutton. She was a guest on Bigger Pockets Real Estate Podcast, episode number 340. She interviewed over 40 turnkey companies before she decided who she was going to invest with. So let's hear what Whitney has to say. First and foremost, when you're investing with a turnkey provider, you need to understand their business model. Is their model vertically integrated, meaning that they will provide all services you need under one roof, such as deal sourcing, construction, and property management? Or are they horizontally integrated, meaning they coordinate different business providers to provide you the finished product? For example, one person may source the deal, then they contract with a construction company to complete the rehab, and then source a property management company in town to place the tenant and manage the deal. While you're still getting a turnkey property, essentially, you want to know who is doing what work and where their responsibility ends and another entity begins. Here are some lesser known questions to ask in your interview. First, what class of property do they like to purchase? Most turnkey providers play in the C minus to B space. Where some investors get taken is that they love the B class finishes they see on the turnkey property. However, the neighborhood is in a solid C minus area. Make sure to do your own market due diligence. How are they sourcing deals? You'll want to understand their main deal sources. Perhaps they find deals from a mold remediation company or a foundation crew. If so, you'll want to triple check all of their work in these areas to make sure they have resolved any issues. Next, what is their standard scope of work? Are they upgrading all big ticket items known as capex, or are they saying anything with five to seven years of life left on the property is good to go? This could be code for they don't want to repair it and you will have to complete this upgrade prior to your sale. Next, you will also want to find out what type of construction warranties and tenant placement warranties they have in place. And if you choose your own property management company, how will this move impact your warranties? 
Make sure you also ask who will be your point of contact once you have closed a deal with them. And call this person up and confirm all de details that you have known in. Also, ask to speak directly with three to five referrals of investors who have purchased multiple properties with them. Again, these are just a few tips and tricks for what to look for when sourcing a turnkey provider. Happy investing. Those are some really great tips that she puts in there. Just that little bit of, you know, information she provided like great value as to what you should ask them uh, when you're interviewing them. I'm really excited for, you know, doing an upcoming episode on that. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. It's going to be really cool to do a whole episode, you know, on turnkey. So I'm excited to do that as well. So those are some of the questions that we've answered from the the, the Facebook group for Real Estate Rookie. Actually, I'm going to ask you, what is one of the questions that you get asked the most as a real estate investor? Honestly, I would have to say how to structure a partnership or how to find a partner. I would definitely have to, to say that. What about you? I get the same one about uh, partnerships because I think a lot of people know that I partner a lot. Um, and you know, they're like, how do you find a good partner? Felipe, you're, you're not always the money. Sometimes it's them, the money, you know, what kind of value do you add? And I get that question a lot. And I always answer it the same way. I'm like, look, if you want to find a good partner, my question to you is, are you a good partner worth finding? Have you educated yourself, you know, um, in the space that you want to, what are you, what are your strengths and are you strengthening your strengths? Don't worry about your weaknesses because your partner should complement that you should be able to to continue to uh, strengthen your strength. So I, I think personally, that's what that's what I would say is, uh, or that's the question that I get the most, how to structure my partnerships. And all that is really relevant and it's super important, but I think more than how to structure it, how to do all that is, are you a great partner? And are you, or do you mesh with the partner that you're gonna have? Yeah, the first time you and I ever talked about this, I said that one thing I thought was really important at first was to make this an opportunity for your partner. And that was like the biggest thing to me was not like saying you need them or anything like that. Like show them how you're going to make them money, show them how you are going to build them up, show them those things and make it an opportunity for them. But when we talked, you had said that to me, how, you know, show what value you can bring as an investor too, and what you have to bring to the table. So that really resonated with me. And I, I really like those two things combined as to, you know, figure out first what you're going to bring to the table and then how you can make this an opportunity for your partner. What are some of the ways that let's give examples of how we've structured our partnerships? Because there really is no right or wrong way. Hey, maybe we should write a book on uh, partnerships for, for newbies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, but, you know, honestly, I think that for me, the, the, the biggest way that I've done it, and like you said, there's no right, there's no wrong. This is just what's worked for us, is I do a 70-30 split until tenants come in and then it goes 50-50. So... My partner brings in 70% of the financing, 70% of the of everything, and I bring in 30% of everything. So it, even through rehab and getting the property rent ready, 70-30 split. The moment we get that first lease signed, everything goes back to 50-50. So you might be asking, well, that's not fair, Felipe. You're only bringing in 30% of the money up front. With all honesty, that might up front not look fair, but my, my business partners love it because I'm finding the deal. I'm boots on the ground. I'm getting all the rents. I'm getting all the tenants. I'm, you know, saving us money everywhere by having this model that we already have and just bringing it to the table. And all they got to do is bring money. I tell a lot of newbies, I say, look, don't underestimate your knowledge and your time. More than not, people that have money don't have the time. I have four partnerships right now and they're all in LLCs. So I back to the LLC question, I would, if you're doing a partnership, I would definitely recommend an LLC. So one partnership is with my sister where we actually did her first house hack and I gave her the down payment and she went and got an FHA mortgage and we are 50-50 on the deed of that property. We just have the duplex together. And then another property is with my brother where we do a siblings Christmas exchange and I gifted him 25% ownership of a property. And you can say, wow, that is generous, but it was a $20,000. <laughs> so not that exciting. So he's 25% owner. He is completely passive and we actually don't take any money out of the LLC. There's very little cash flow on this property. It will need some repairs coming up. So uh, we've just been keeping all the money in there and we don't even take anything out. 
And then I have uh, my first ever partner where he was put in all of the money. We are 50, 50% um, equity of the LLC. And we actually did a, a note payable back to him for any money he put into the LLC. So he was getting 50% of the cash flow. Plus, he was getting 5.5% um, interest on the money he had lent the LLC. So I think that was a, a very good deal for him. But also, I couldn't have gotten started without having that first partner to trust me and to want to work with me and believe in what I could do. And he is also 100% passive. And then my second partner, and that's not a sibling, we have 50-50 everything. So we... Before we outsourced our property management, I was doing the leasing, collecting the rent, the bookkeeping, and he was doing any maintenance, stuff like that. And then any money that was put into the deal, we did 50% of that. So those are just some examples of how I've structured my deals. But so like my partner that were 50-50 everything and he does the maintenance, like the reason we did that was because he is super handy and good at that stuff and I'm good at bookkeeping. So we first looked at, you know, what we could bring to the table and that's why we set that up. And my other partner, he's not handy at all. He doesn't want to do any bookkeeping. He doesn't want to do anything like that, but he had the money. So that's why we set up that partnership. And my sister, she needed her first ever house. And that's why we set up that. <laughs> Before you decide how you want to structure a partnership, you have to first decide on the partner and look at your strengths and weaknesses and then build your, your structure from there. So really those are like five of the biggest rookie questions. I, I mean, I, I can't think of anything else that is really more commonly asked than those five questions. Can you? No, I think those were great questions. Great, you know, starter rookie questions. And I think those are some of the ones that we get the most. If you have more questions like that, you're more than welcome to post them on the Facebook group, The Rookie Real Estate. And, uh, you know, every now and then me and Ashley hop on there and we'll answer some questions. And, and then you never know if it might get on the show or not. So thanks for definitely doing that. We'd love answering those questions. Hopefully we can do more of these later going forward. And I want to make sure that uh, you guys call into the rookie request line too. So that's one 888 five rookie and leave us some voicemails uh, because we love to listen to those and our guests love to answer those questions too. So please leave us some voicemails and let's wrap it up from here. So Felipe, that was kind of fun just doing it, me and you. I mean, I love to have a guest and to learn all this stuff, but I feel like every day I'm still learning stuff from you. So it was fun to do. Absolutely. I love answering those questions because it kind of brings me back to the beginning. And that's always really yeah. good to kind of go back to the basics and make sure that you are, you know, you still have those tools sharpened because they are still in your tool belt. So like Ashley said, guys, thank you so much for, um, you know, putting in your questions. We'd love to answer them. You can always uh, post more on the Facebook group and uh, we'll definitely get to those as much as we can. So today has been a great show. Episode 21. And we look forward to seeing you next time. You can find me, Ashley Kerr, at Wealth From Rentals. And you can find Felipe Mejia at Felipe Mejia, R-E-I. Thank you, guys. And we'll see you next Wednesday. Yeah.